Welcome to Anchored by Truth, brought to you by Crystal Sea Books. In John 14.6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Our goal is to encourage everyone to grow in the Christian faith by anchoring themselves to the secure truth found in the inspired, inerrant, and infallible Word of God. Several people from Chloe's family have already reported to me that you keep arguing with each other. They have said that some of you claim to follow me, while others claim to follow Apollos, or Peter, or Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 11 and 12, Contemporary English Version Hello, I'm Victoria Kay. Welcome to Anchored by Truth, brought to you by Crystal Sea Books. We're very glad to be with you today. We are in the midst of a series on Anchored by Truth that we are calling Paul's Places. By Paul, of course, we're referring to the Apostle Paul, who wrote at least 13 of the books out of the 27 books that comprise the New Testament. Most people know that the Apostle Paul was the foremost apostle to the Gentiles. As part of his ministry, he wrote a number of letters to various churches. Many of these letters have been preserved in the books of the New Testament. In fact, God used Paul to write almost half of the New Testament, including 1st and 2nd Corinthians. In our last episode of Anchored by Truth, we started looking at these letters to the Corinthians, and we're going to conclude that look today. In the studio today, we have R.D. Fierro, an author and founder of Crystal Sea Books. R.D., why don't you remind us what this series, Paul's Places, is all about, and give us a brief summary of where we are. Well, I'd like to start by thanking all of our listeners for joining us here today. As our longtime listeners know, Anchored by Truth is a radio show and a podcast that is focused on helping people develop a solid understanding of why they may be confident that the Bible is the inspired, inerrant, and infallible Word of God. Well, one of the key points to people having that confidence is to see that the books of the Bible are trustworthy from the standpoint of history. In our opinion here at Anchored by Truth, any book that claims to be the word of an almighty and perfect God would have to, at a minimum, meet at least two criteria. First, the book would have to be consistent with what we know about the history of the natural world and the history of humanity. And second, the book would have to contain evidence of a supernatural point of origin. And you cite four lines of evidence that the Bible meets these two criteria. Reliable history, remarkable unity, fulfilled prophecy, and redeemed destinies. Right. So we believe that any book claiming to be the Word of God would have to be consistent with what we know about, as we've said, natural history and human history, the human history in the parts of the Bible upon which the Bible reports. And in the case of the New Testament, the history with which the Bible is primarily concerned is the history of the Roman Empire. The books of the New Testament were all written during the latter portion of the first century AD. At that time, the Roman Empire was the dominant power in Europe and the Middle East and North Africa. At its height, the Roman Empire extended all the way from modern-day India to England and included most of the Mediterranean coast of North Africa. Yes, and since Jesus lived, died, and rose from the dead in what is today modern-day Israel, That was the point, modern-day Israel, the land of Palestine, that was the point of origin of Christianity. In essence, Christianity began in Jerusalem and spread outward through the rest of Palestine, then through the adjoining nations, then through the eastern part of the Roman Empire, and of course, ultimately, Christianity has spread throughout the world. But as you noted, the books of our New Testament were all written in the latter half of the first century A.D., So, during that period of time, the gospel had spread considerably beyond Jerusalem and Israel, and it had gone all the way to such modern-day nations as Syria, Lebanon, Turkey, Greece, and Italy. So, those are the nations in which the New Testament events were primarily occurring. So, one question that we can reasonably ask is whether the books of the New Testament give evidence that they were authentic letters written to people who lived in those places at that time. And that's why we're doing this Paul's Places, 
we're looking at the content of the New Testament letters and seeing whether that content makes sense from the standpoint of what we know about the geography, culture, and people of the time. And last time, we saw that 1st and 2nd Corinthians do contain a great deal of evidence that the concerns Paul expressed would have been legitimate concerns for a city like Corinth. For instance, we saw that Corinth is located on an isthmus that joins northern and southern Greece. As such, it was a very active city for trade and commerce. It was literally the meeting place where east met west in terms of the Roman Empire. It had two port cities that serviced it, one on its east and one on its west. Ships would arrive in those ports and offload their goods. Those cargoes were then taken to Corinth and sold or exchanged for something else. Then the ships were reloaded with the new merchandise and headed back to another port, usually in the opposite direction. So Corinth was not only filled with merchants and traders, but also sailors, buyers, and travelers. And, in addition to that, the most prominent Roman goddess that was worshipped in Corinth during the first century AD was the goddess Venus. Now, Venus was the Roman version of the Greek goddess Aphrodite. Aphrodite was the ancient Greek goddess associated with love, lust, beauty, pleasure, passion, and procreation. And in Corinth, there was a huge temple dedicated to Venus on the south side of the city. And at that temple to Venus, there were a thousand temple prostitutes, and they served essentially as the priestesses at the temple. In short, sexual immorality was a prominent feature of life in Corinth. From the 5th century BC onward, the expression to Corinthianize meant to be sexually immoral. Given all that, you would expect that when Paul was writing to the Corinthians, he might have to pay special attention to the problems of avoiding sexual immorality. And he did. Paul devoted more attention to the problems of dealing with sexual immorality in 1 Corinthians than he did in any of his other epistles. Epistle is just another word for letter. Often, the books of the New Testament that Paul wrote are referred to as Pauline epistles. Yes. So the fact that Paul spent almost three chapters out of the 16 chapters of 1 Corinthians just dealing with the problem of sexual immorality, that's very strong evidence that the letters to the Corinthians are authentic communications that were directed to believers in the city of Corinth during the first century A.D. And we know that Corinth was a city within the Roman world where temptation abounded. In Corinth, money was made quickly. Money was often lost quickly. And the believers who were part of the Christian church in Corinth, they were living in a licentious and dissolute society. In other words, the character of the letter that Paul wrote to the church in Corinth, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, those letters match perfectly with what we know of the character of the city. And that was true in other respects besides just the problem with sexual immorality. What are you thinking about? Well, Corinth was not only a thoroughly immoral city, but it was also a very competitive city. You know, in a city where goods and merchandise are coming in and going out every day, where ships have schedules that they want to meet, where money is changing hands every minute of every day, and where the velocity of the economy is tied literally to the prosperity of the empire, well, obviously the competition to be the best is going to be fierce in that kind of an environment. Last time, we noted that Corinth was sort of the Roman Empire's version of Las Vegas. And anyone who's ever been to Las Vegas can see the evidence of competition all around them. No sooner is one giant hotel or casino built than another developer comes along who wants to build something bigger and grander. One brilliant light display is quickly eclipsed by another. Every Vegas show competes with every other Vegas show. It seems like each new project must be bigger, grander, and showier than the last. Right. Corinth was Vegas without the electricity. And it would have been that way just based on the geography, economy, and culture of the city. But as if all that weren't enough, Corinth was also the site of one of the most famous of the ancient Greek sporting events that were called the Isthmian Games. The Isthmian Games were similar in size and scope to the Olympic Games. The Isthmian Games were one of the so-called Panhellenic Games of ancient Greece. And the Isthmian Games were named after the Isthmus of Corinth, where they were held. 
The Isthmian Games were held both the year before and the year after the Olympic Games, while another set of games, the Pythian Games, were held in the third year of the Olympiad cycle. And the Pan-Hellenic Games was a collective term for four separate sports festivals that were held in ancient Greece. The four festivals were the Olympics, the best known of the ones because we still have the Olympics today, the Isthmian Games, the Pythian Games, and the Nemean Games. The Olympics started the cycle of the Games. The Olympics and the Pythian Games were held every four years, whereas the Isthmian and the Nemean Games were held every two years. In other words, the ancient Greeks were very fond of their sports. I guess that isn't too much different from today. And also like today, the cities that hosted the Games would have benefited economically from the Games as well as being proud of their status as a host city. I see what you're getting at. There was a highly competitive atmosphere present in Corinth because of its status as an important commercial and trading center. But beyond that, the fact that one of the ancient world's premier sporting events was regularly conducted in Corinth would have added to that atmosphere of competitiveness. Exactly. So as we continue our look at how the culture and geography were reflected in the letters that Paul sent to the various church congregations, We can see that this competitive atmosphere was present not just outside the Corinthian church, but also inside it. I'm sure one of the passages in 1 Corinthians that you have in mind is what we heard in our opening scripture. This is verses 11 and 12 of the first chapter of 1 Corinthians. Those verses say, For some members of Chloe's household had told me about your quarrels, My dear brothers and sisters, some of you are saying, I am a follower of Paul. Others are saying, I follow Apollos, or I follow Peter, or I follow only Christ. That's from the New Living Translation. Yes, these verses tell us, they show us, that rather than being unified around the gospel, the members of the Corinthian church had begun to identify with specific personalities that were prominent in the first century A.D. church. In other words, at least some members of the church were drifting off into a cult of personality. They had lost their focus on Christ and what Christ came to the earth to do, and they had lost focus, frankly, on Christ's command that the way the world would know Christ's followers was by their love for one another, the Corinthian church had lost focus on those basics. So the Corinthian church was being split by this competition among the members, and one portion of this competition had to do with some members of the church being more focused on specific figures rather than being unified by their love and commitment to Christ. So members of the Christian church were becoming unduly focused on personalities. In other words, you think that what Paul was observing was that these people who were claiming loyalty to Peter or Apollos were doing so in the spirit of one-upsmanship. Yes, and we know that from the rebuke that Paul gave to the Corinthian believers after he made the observation about what the people in Chloe's household had told him. Paul said in verses 13 through 15, and I'm quoting now, Has Christ been divided into factions? Was I, Paul, crucified for you? Were any of you baptized in the name of Paul? Of course not. I thank God that I did not baptize any of you except Crispus and Gaius. For now, no one can say that they were baptized in my name. End quote. So evidently the Corinthians had started bragging about who had baptized them, as though the person who baptized them made a difference in the effect of the baptism. Paul was basically saying, hey, I'm glad I only baptized a couple of you, not because he did not want the Corinthian church to grow and be vital, he certainly did, but because Paul was saying, look, don't draw me into your competition. Don't draw me into the contentions that's going on between you and other members of your church. I'm not interested in being part of this baptismal competition. Rather like people often do today. Some of the Corinthians were competing by identifying who performed their baptism as if that person were a sports star or a celebrity, and Paul would have none of it. Paul knew that people being the way they are, this inevitably leads to a spirit of competition as each group claims that its star is the greatest. Kind of like arguing over which quarterback or tennis player is the greatest. Right. So this baptismal competition, that was just one example that the competitive culture that pervaded the city of Corinth had entered the church in an unhealthy way. 
Are there other examples in 1 Corinthians that showed that this competitive culture was present among the Corinthian believers? Unfortunately, yes. So let's take a look at 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 26 through 39. Now, in that section, Paul is giving the Corinthians instructions about how to conduct their worship services. Apparently, there was a substantial amount of disorder during their communal worship because the believers in Corinth were competing with one another over who got to give a message, who got to give a speech, who got to present a revelation. Apparently, some of the Corinthians had come to think so highly of themselves that some of them were actually almost thinking about themselves being on the level of being an apostle, you know, receiving new revelations which they just had to communicate to their fellow believers and to their church. In fact, in verses 36 and 37, Paul actually asked them, quote, Do you think God's word originated with you, Corinthians? Are you the only ones to whom it was given? If you claim to be a prophet or think you are a spiritual, you should recognize that what I am saying is a command from the Lord himself, unquote. That's also from the New Living Translation. The Amplified Bible puts it this way, quote, Did the word of the Lord originate from you, Corinthians? Or has it come to you only so that you know best what God requires, unquote? Exactly. So chapter 14 of 1 Corinthians makes it clear that this spirit of competition was manifesting itself in disorder within the corporate worship services in the church of Corinth. And then in a different chapter, chapter 11 makes it clear that they were competing even in the food that they brought to the services. So apparently, at least as part of some of their communal worship, there was a custom of having a meal. Well, that's fine when it's done appropriately. But in the case of the Corinthians, it wasn't being done appropriately. So let's take a quick look at verses 20 through 22 of chapter 11. The New Living Translation of those verses says, quote, When you meet together, you are not really interested in the Lord's Supper. For some of you hurry to eat your own meal without sharing with others. As a result, some go hungry while others get drunk. Do you really want to disgrace God's church and shame the poor? What am I supposed to say? Do you want me to praise you? Well, I certainly will not praise you for this, unquote. And let's go further. Just one more example of how this spirit of competition had infected the church in Corinth is that the Corinthians were apparently competing in what is often termed the gifts of the spirit. And we see that from chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians. Paul summed up his assessment of how the Corinthians had been behaving with respect to spiritual gifts in verses 29 and 30 of chapter 12. The New Living Translation of those verses says, Are we all apostles? Are we all prophets? Are we all teachers? Do we have the power to do miracles? Do we have the gift of healing? Do we have the ability to speak in unknown languages? Do we have all the ability to interpret unknown languages? Of course not, unquote. Yes, the general culture of the city of Corinth contained a very strong strain of competition because the nature of the economy and the regular conduct of the Isthmian games within the city promoted a spirit of competition. So from all these examples that we've just given from the letter that Paul wrote that we call 1 Corinthians, we can see that this spirit of competition had entered the Corinthian church. And as a result, the Apostle Paul had to deal with the divisions that this spirit of competition was producing within the church. And so Paul dealt with that when he wrote his letters to the church there. So all of the issues that Paul had to address in 1 and 2 Corinthians give strong evidence that that was a letter from an apostle sent to the Gentiles to a group of believers living in Corinth during the first century A.D., because Paul's letters to the Corinthian church reflect the kinds of concerns that would have been prominent in a city like Corinth during that period in history. But oddly enough, providentially, really, as only God can do, God used the occasion of the divisions that were cropping up within the Corinthian church to produce some of the most important teachings in his scripture. In response to the competition among the Corinthians to have better, quote, spiritual gifts than their fellow church members, Paul wrote chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians, which is well known as the classic chapter on Christian love in the Bible. And in response to the spirit of competition over the food being consumed at the church meals, Paul wrote one of the clearest statements in the Bible about one of the most important sacraments, the Lord's Supper. Exactly. 
And as we saw in our last episode of Anchored by Truth, we saw that Paul used the temptation to sexual immorality present within the city to give very clear directions to the church about how to deal with such temptation. Said differently, God used the problems that were confronting the Corinthian church to provide clear guidance that would help believers for the next 2,000 years. God turned evil into good, as only God can. Absolutely. God took the problems present within the Corinthian church that were at least largely probably there because of the nature of the surrounding culture, and instead of letting the evil and temptation dominate, God brought eternal benefits for his entire church out of those problems. Well, this is just a very dramatic illustration of the nature of God's grace. God does not let the evil of man overcome his own intentions to produce good for his people. And the fact that the Corinthian believers did respond to Paul's admonitions is evident from the content of the letter that we call 2 Corinthians. In 2 Corinthians, Paul took great pains to begin providing comfort to the Corinthian church rather than continuing to rebuke them. And one of the points you wanted to make today was that even though our Bible contains two of the letters Paul wrote to the Corinthian church, it's plain from 1 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 9 that Paul wrote at least one more letter to them. The contemporary English version of that verse says, quote, In my other letter, I told you not to have anything to do with immoral people, unquote. Since this verse is contained in 1 Corinthians, it's apparent Paul had sent them an earlier version that has not been preserved. Right. And many scholars actually believe that Paul had sent the Corinthian church yet another letter in addition to those letters that we call First and Second Corinthians. A lot of scholars refer to this potential fourth letter as the, quote, severe letter. And it's thought that this so-called severe letter resulted from a quick trip that Paul made to Corinth from Ephesus when Paul had been poorly treated by the church, or at least some people within the church. So many scholars think that the spirit of repentance that Paul recognized in 2 Corinthians came because he had sent this so-called severe letter. So if Paul did send this severe letter, that letter also has not been preserved. And that also helps us demonstrate the authenticity of the letters that we do have, doesn't it? It shows that the people who were involved in this back and forth were real people. When real people send real communication to one another, sometimes some of it gets lost. God ensured that the preservation of those letters that he determined were to be part of his inspired word. But the material in 1st and 2nd Corinthians shows that just because an apostle or prophet wrote or said something, that did not automatically mean it was intended to be part of the Bible. Yes. One of the big points that we're making in this Paul's Places series is that unlike the assertions of some Bible critics, the Bible is not filled with, quote, myths and fairy tales. The Bible contains a record of real people doing real things in real places during the real history of the world. And during that real history, Christian leaders, like Paul, were dealing with very real problems. And very often, those problems were created by, or at least exacerbated, by the places in which those struggling Christians were living. And that, frankly, is how God deals with us. We all live in a real world, and we all have real problems. But it's comforting for us to know that the same transcendent power that God used to bring good out of the problems that were present in the Corinthian church is still available to help us today. And we should add one final note before we close for today. Competition does not have to create division. Properly understood and used, competition can help people, teams, and companies improve their performance and the lives of others. Right. Throughout history, Christians have been very successful in sports and business. In other words, Christians have been good competitors as well as good Christians. But a good competitor is one who strives to do his or her best while also encouraging others to be their best. And we used to recognize this in this country and around the world. We used to recognize that you can be a good competitor or a good business person and also be a good Christian. We used to use the term good sportsmanship to refer to a competitor who did their absolute best but always played fair. And they were always willing to congratulate someone else on their victory. And if that person came out on top, they weren't arrogant or filled with unseeming pride. They were humble when they came out on top in the competition. 
And sadly, in today's sports, business, and political worlds, those kinds of people are increasingly rare. You know, today we're more often likely to hear something like, well, you have to win at all costs, or being the second place is the first loser. In our society, good-natured ribbing that used to occur, that's given way to all too often obscene trash talk. And gracious winners are almost unknown. And this is extraordinarily sad because it deprives our kids of knowing that it is possible to be a strong competitor while also being very kind and generous whether you win or whether you lose. We used to know all this, but as competition for attention has grown within our own culture, it seems as though we have lost some of what used to be time-honored wisdom. Well, one of the best ways for us to reclaim this time-honored wisdom is for parents to begin to immerse themselves in the Word of God so they can begin to teach their kids how to develop godly characters. This sounds like a great time for a prayer. Since Father's Day is almost here, today let's listen to a prayer for fathers. Godly fathers are certainly one of the best gifts any child can receive. And for those who are not blessed with a godly father, It's also a good idea to pray for them to come to Jesus. Our prayers for our family members can move hearts and change eternal destinies. A Prayer for Fathers Lord God Almighty, You are the strength and stability of my life. In You we have the security of knowing that You love and accept us no matter what condition we are in when we come to you. Yet we also have the inspiration of knowing that you call us to live holy and pure lives. Your desire for each of us is to mature and become better citizens of your kingdom and better servants to our community. Thank you for being a God who loves us so much that you want the best for us. Lord, I come to you today to seek your blessing on my Father. In the Bible, you have invited us to call you Father, so we know that being a father is a role never to be taken lightly. I pray that you would help my father to be the kind of model that you want him to be, and that you would be the special power in his life that enables him to fulfill his role. I know that often my father struggles with so many competing priorities. He wants to be many things to many different people, and in our fallen world, None of us will ever live up fully to what we expect of ourselves. Help him to understand, Lord, that as long as he sets his heart on you and seeks first to be a faithful son to you, that all the other things will be added to his life. I pray for health and strength for my father. You know better than any of us when he is tired or hurt, So I pray that you would grant him healing, health, and restoration as he grows weary or ill. I pray that you would comfort him as he finds cares and troubles pressing about him. You know that my father wants to be a problem solver and take the burden from others' shoulders. Help him to do all he can. But I also pray that you would send him your peace when it's time for him to rest from his labor. I pray that you would surround him with friends and companions. I know that he loves being with family, and I pray that ours will always be a close one. But I also know that there are times when he needs to be with good friends who can provide him with companionship that comes from a set of truly devoted friends. I pray that he would be a blessing to them, and they to him. You are truly our great Father. We know of your love and affection for us because you sent your Son to tell us about you and then ordained that he should die to save us. We are awed by his great love and yours. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. We hope you'll be with us next time, and we hope you'll take some time to encourage some friends to tune in also, or listen to the podcast version of this show. If you'd like to hear more, Try out crystalseabooks.com where we're not perfect, but our boss is.